вкладчик по приветствуем Шон Гриффин. Welcome. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Sean Griffin. I'm a 10x hacker ninja guru at Shopify. If you're wondering what that means, it means that I wanted to see what would happen if I put that on a form once, and what happened was the Canadian government gave me a work permit for 10x hacker ninja guru, and now I cannot legally work in Canada as any other job title. Uh, I'm a committer on Ruby on Rails. I'm the maintainer of Active Record. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I also work on an ORM for the Rust programming language called Diesel, and every week I host a podcast called The Bike Shed. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you want to tweet at me, I am at sgriff on Twitter, and when this is done, I'm going to look at how many tweets I got and base my entire self-worth on that, so please tweet. I'd also like to just state for the record that I'm very mad at Steve. I was going to talk about Rust. I was so ready to talk about Rust, it was going to be a great talk, and then I found out Steve was going to be here, and so I had to change my talk. So, you're a jerk, Steve. You and your face. So, failing that, my next topic was, how do we keep Rails relevant? There's been a lot of talk about, is Rails dying? Is Rails becoming irrelevant? And so I wanted to see if we could try to answer that question, and if we are on that path, how do we avoid it? Now, as I started working on this, this is the last talk I'm going to be giving for quite some time. I'm having a baby in February. <laughs> it's a girl. We're naming her Ruby because we're bad at naming things. <laughs> uh, so, since this is one of the last talks I'm going to be giving, I figured I wanted to talk about something which is just one of my favorite things on the planet and has done a really good job at remaining relevant. This is the Soyuz spacecraft. Its most used variant has flown 784 times. It's seen 43 years of active service. It's part of the greater R7 family of rockets, which combined have seen over 1,700 launches. It's the family of rockets that launched Sputnik and it's still the workhorse of spaceflight today. So if there's anywhere that we can learn about how to keep something relevant, it's this amazing piece of Russian engineering. And I'm really into space. So if this is gonna be my last talk for a while, fuck it, we're gonna talk about spaceships. <laughs> so welcome to Spaceship Conf 2016. I'm very excited to be here. Before we can see how uh, the R7 relates to our world in software, let's take a brief look at how spaceflight started. The history of modern spaceflight begins with a Russian scientist named Tsiolkovsky. In 1896, he created something which is now known as the Tsiolkovsky rocket equation, which he published in 1897. This is the formula. Yes, I am starting this conference with math. Now, if you're like me, this sort of notation is completely meaningless to you, so let's look at it in terms of code from a program that I wrote. However, I wrote that program in Rust, and since Steve is here, uh, we're not going to talk about Rust, so we'll look at it in Ruby instead. Uh, so this is the formula that is mo uh, one of the most important numbers when it comes to rockets. Delta V, or change in velocity. In space, there's no air to slow you down. All changes in your speed are done by your rocket's engines. If you speed up by a certain amount, you're also going to have to slow yourself down by that same amount. What this basically ends up meaning is that the uh, amount of delta V that your rocket has determines how far you can travel. Now, the way that we calculate this number is by starting with the specific impulse of the engine. Specific impulse determines how much thrust an engine produces per unit of fuel. Now, the wet mass of a rocket is the, over, the, the mass of the craft when it has all of its fuel on board. And dry mass is the mass of the craft after it has burned off all of its fuel. So the mass of the engine, the tanks, and any payload that it's carrying uh, account for the dry mass. <laughs> 
So the rocket equation multiplies the specific impulse of the engine by the natural logarithm of the ratio between the two masses. The formula as it was originally published assumed that specific impulse was measured as a unit of velocity. However, today we commonly represent it as a unit of time, so in order to convert that to the right unit, we have to multiply that times the gravitational constant, or 9.8066 meters per second squared. So, yeah, yeah, maybe it's a little bit too early in the morning for this much math, but uh, from that formula in 1903, Tsiolkovsky was able to determine that in order to orbit the Earth, you would need a horizontal velocity of 8,000 meters per second, and that this could be achieved by a multi-stage rocket fueled by liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. We also use that same math to determine how much delta V is required to get anywhere in the solar system. So these numbers are really small, but uh, so for example, from low Earth orbit, an orbit of about 200 kilometers around the Earth, we know that it takes an additional 3,300 uh, 3, meters per second to reach the moon. If you want to orbit the moon when you got there, that's going to take another 660 meters per second. To get from low Earth orbit to geostationary orbit, which is at an altitude of about 36.5 kilometers, that would take another 4,000 meters per second of delta V. So the second founding father, as they're, as they're sometimes called, of rocket science was an American named Robert Goddard. In 1914, he began research on the first liquid-fueled rocket engines. Prior to Goddard's work, most uh, research done on rocketry was with solid fuels, which is basically fireworks. Uh, the, the things that were used for early siege weapons in ancient China were all, sort, were all based on the same uh, technologies that we now use in solid rocket boosters. But liquid fuel was going to be required to really start to actually push rocketry forward to do things like the modern weapons or spacecraft that we have today. By 1926, Goddard had acquired quite a few patents and he achieved the world's first rocket flight. Now, this is a picture from America, but every time I see this, I just think it looks like something out of Russia from the time. <laughs> so the rocket itself was really, really tiny. Uh, it's only about twice as tall as Goddard was himself. It burned a mixture of 75% uh, water and 25% liquid ethanol, which was a common fuel at the time. And it also burned liquid oxygen. Now, this thing only went uh, 41 feet high. <laughs> during its two and a half second flight, and it landed in a cornfield about 180 feet downrange. So it was not necessarily the most successful rocket in history, uh, but this achievement sort of laid the foundation for all rockets that would come after it. Uh, one interesting note about, about this rocket, so this thing at the, at the, on the bottom here, this is the fuel tank, and the engine is up at the front and pulls the fuel tank rather than pushing it like all modern rockets do today. Uh, so quite different and probably, I'm going to assume, not the best idea since we don't do anything that looks even remotely like that anymore. So the third and final founding father of rocketry was a German, a physicist named Hermann Oberth. Early on, in their careers, he and Goddard shared a lot of their research. They would speak quite frequently. Uh, as time progressed, Goddard would become more paranoid, more secretive, and he and Oberth stopped sharing. Eventually, he even accused Oberth of plagiarism. Five years after Goddard's launch in 1931, Oberth also launched his own liquid-fueled rocket, uh, marking the second person to launch liquid-fueled rockets. He's best known for his work on uh, what's known as the Oberth effect. The Oberth effect states how the gravitational well of a planet affects uh, the, the energy that a craft gains when it burns its engine. And this effect is the basis for all orbital maneuvers that we plan today. The idea is that the uh, closer to a planet you are, the faster you're going. So if you have an orbit where you go from very close to the planet to very far away from the planet, uh, 
you gain significantly more energy by burning your engines when you're very close to that planet. And it also demonstrated that we can do what's called a gravity assist, where you sort of slingshot around a planet um, doing a very small maneuver to make a very large change to your overall orbit. And that is the, the basis of how we are able to send craft to places like Jupiter or Uranus, which are very, very hard to reach just by directly burning the engines. Oberth was also a teacher. And uh, one of his students is somebody who would go on to become very famous, another German scientist named Werner von Braun. Von Braun built what is generally considered to be the root of all rockets, other than, other than of course, that, uh, that very first rocket that Goddard launched. So von Braun's rockets were known as the A-series. In 1942, one of his rockets was the first rocket to cross the Kármán line. The Kármán line is something that's named after Theodore von Kármán. And Theodore von Kármán calculated that uh, at a certain altitude, around 100 kilometers, if you had an airplane, the amount of air at that altitude, uh, for the plane to gain enough lift on its wings with that little air, the speed it would have to be going just to stay in flight is actually the speed required to orbit the Earth. So 99% of our air is, uh, in our atmosphere is below 100 kilometers. So as a result of that, of that calculation, uh, the Kármán line is universally recognized as the dividing line between the atmosphere and space. Uh, contrary to some common beliefs, there is, no, there is no actual line where just like there's no more air, it just sort of slowly fades off. So the most famous rocket of the A series was publicly known as the V2. It was uh, known as the A4 to the people who created it. And this was the first guided missile that was ever used. It was used by the Nazis against Great Britain during World War II. It wasn't terribly accurate. It ended up doing a lot more damage to civilians than to the military. But it showed, it showed promise. Uh, but the war ended before the Nazi rocket program could progress to something that was an actual useful military tool. Still, after the war ended, both the U.S. and the Soviets saw the potential, of the potential applications of rocketry, both for military purposes and otherwise. So when the, uh, when the Nazi regime fell, both sides immediately scooped up as many Nazi rocket scientists as they could and brought, them, and brought them into their countries. Oberth and von Braun, and von Braun were the two most well-known uh, rocket scientists at the time, and they both went to America. But the Soviet Union had a, lot of, had a lot of German scientists that came as well. So after the war, the Soviet program was primarily led by a man named Sergei Korolev. So the first thing that they built was called the R-1. The R-1 was simply a pure clone of the V-2 rocket, but it was entirely Soviet manufactured. Even though it was just a straight copy, it gave them a lot of experience on how to manufacture the required pieces, the required materials, the fuels needed to produce a rocket. With this valuable experience, they were able to start constructing more involved rockets. And soon after, the Cold War would begin. And the United States and Russia decided, we want to, show, we want to flex our muscles as much as we can and show that we could totally nuke the crap out of the other one if we wanted to. Uh, the V-2 didn't have nearly enough range for uh, Russia or the U.S. to use it against each other. So in 1950, a decree was given authorizing the research project titled Development Requirements for a Liquid Rocket with a Range of 5,000 to 10,000 Kilometers and a Warhead of 1 to 10 metric tons. The result of this research program was, was what could be considered the single largest contribution to spaceflight, the R-7 missile. Now, the R-7 Semyorka, there are two variations here. The R-7A is the one that actually saw service. That's the, the warhead that's on the top. And then the, the original R-7 uh, has more, that more cone-shaped warhead. The R-7A could go much farther and was much cheaper to build. Uh, 
So there were four strap-on boosters. The core was, uh, was evolved from the R1. It got longer, the engines got bigger and more efficient, and then, they just, and then the result was something that was so heavy it couldn't get itself off the ground alone, so they added these additional four strap-on boosters to the side. During flight, eventually the rocket reaches a predetermined speed. This happens at about two minutes after launch, and at that point the boosters separate from the rest of the craft, and they fall away. The core engine continues burning for another three minutes after that, and then once it has reached its predetermined speed so that uh, it's at the right, it's at the right uh, trajectory to go to its target, that engine cuts off, the warhead would separate and go and bombard whatever they were trying to blow up. Now, it's worth noting, right, this rocket wasn't built just for the sake of building a cool rocket, which, I mean, hey, if they wanted to just build a cool rocket, that'd be good. But this was, this was driven by a very concrete need. They had a specific range in mind. They had a specific weight in mind. So they weren't building for the sake of building. They, knew, they, they came up with the, the need that they were trying to fill, the problem that they were trying to solve, and they built specifically to try and solve that problem. The R7 was never put into production as a weapon of war. That would wait until the R7A years later. The, the original R7, though, did end up being used for one very important little silver ball. In 1957, a slightly modified R7 was used to launch Sputnik 1. Now, it's interesting to me about this satellite was that it had no scientific instruments on it. They weren't launching this to, to, we did end up gaining a little bit of information by analyzing its radio signals, and we learned a, a good bit about our ionosphere. Uh, but this wasn't launched with the intention of doing a lot of science in space. The majority of the mass on this craft was devoted purely to the battery. Once this was in orbit, it lasted for 22 days uh, before the batteries gave out, which is a lot longer than anybody expected. It stayed in orbit for about three months, which was also a lot longer than anybody expected. And this thing's job was to orbit the Earth and beep. And it beeped really damn well. Anyone with a normal radio could just turn to the, tune to the right channel and hear this thing beeping. And so that gave undeniable evidence that the Soviets had beaten the Americans into space, that they had a satellite orbiting. Circled the Earth at a, uh, its peak altitude of 650 kilometers, and this drove a lot of a lot of fear into uh, the Americans. If the Soviets could get something into space, they could be spying on us. It also was subtly demonstrating, hey, we can send a, a missile anywhere on the planet. This thing was light; it just did the absolute bare minimum required. The heavier payloads would come later, the science would come later, but they started small. So I think there's something that we can uh, a lot that we can learn from this. In open source, this might be considered optimizing for adoption even. But you don't have to always build something that is the final complete product that solves every problem under the sun. You just do the bare minimum required to get on people's radar. In this case, literally on people's radar. <laughs> Meanwhile, in America. Things didn't necessarily go so well. Uh, there was a lot of trouble getting anything just off the ground, and there were lots of explodey bits. Uh, and in fact, the Vanguard program, the first attempt for the Americans to try and launch their own satellite, which came a few weeks after Sputnik, was publicly televised all over the world. The thing went a few inches off the ground and then exploded violently on the pad. It was incredibly embarrassing, but the complexity of the crafts that the Americans were trying to build came back to bite them and, ca and caused them to fall very, very far behind in the space race. So this is the engine that was on the R7 rocket. The center engine was an RD-108, and the strap-on boosters were four RD-107s. These are basically the same engine. The RD-108... Uh, seven produces a little bit more thrust, but consumes fuel a little bit more quickly and, produce, and has a, a lower overall specific impulse. The RD-108 doesn't produce as much thrust, but it can, burn, it can uh, produce a lot more thrust with the same amount of fuel than the RD-107 can. 
So there have been over 1,700 flights of the R7. 1,700 flights times five engines per rocket with four combustion chambers per engine, plus all of the ground test models. That's an awful lot of engines. So this engine has seen some work. Now, the design of this engine was very unique at the time. Uh, despite this appearance, this is, not, this is one engine. This is not four different engines. Uh, it has one turbo pump, which is feeding the fuel from, the, from that tank, into four separate combustion chambers. The engines themselves were fixed in place. They couldn't, they couldn't turn at all. So in order to give attitude control to the craft, they added what are called vernier nozzles. Tiny, tiny little additional engines that go on the side and that can move quite a bit. There were two verniers on each of the RD-107s, and each one could only move on a single axis. But combined, all four of those engines gave full control over the pitch, the yaw, and the roll of the craft. And then the RD-108 had four verniers on it so that it could continue to have full control once the boosters separated. So this was a lot of vernier engines in total, and that meant that the craft had a large degree of attitude control. It was very easy to turn. And this design with the four separate combustion chambers on the single engine turned out to be a huge boon to the Soviets. Uh, it, it made it possible for them to evolve the engine very easily. They could make lots of little, uh, little improvements bet uh, between designs. Because what they could do is they could very quickly prove out the design of one engine and then just scale it up to four without having to redesign it to, to operate on this many chambers. So making it easy to experiment is something that was very important to the success of the R7 and is, and is important to the success of open source projects. It could very, very, uh, the engine could just continuously receive very small improvements to thrust or to fuel consumption over its lifespan. Now another interesting aspect of the design was how they launched it. All American rockets at the time used a single engine and it would have clamps that would hold it down. They would ignite the engine, because the, the engine required a additional chemical uh, reaction to, to get started, because the fuels wouldn't just ignite automatically. Uh, and then once, the en once they confirmed that the engine had ignited properly and it was producing enough thrust, the clamps would let go, and the, and the rocket would lift off. The R7 had no clamps. In fact, it was actually suspended over the launch pad by some cables. And what they would do is they would ignite the boosters, those RD-107s, those four engines would get ignited, but that wouldn't produce enough thrust to take off. So once they confirmed that the, uh, that the boosters had successfully ignited and were producing full thrust, then they would ignite the central engine, and the power of all five engines combined produced just enough thrust for the thing to get off the ground, and the thrust alone would cause it to fly. One thing that you would find in the earliest models of this that you won't see today, there was an actual hand crank on the engines, and during the fueling, there was a valve that could get clogged up, so a, a soldier would have to actually just stand there and continuously crank the engine while they uh, pumped in this highly explosive rocket fuel. And then the, the, the uh, valve would just close automatically later on. You, they didn't actually just stand there when it took off because they would die. <laughs> um, and this, engi this engine also uh, used a brand new rocket fuel, which is uh, brand new for the time, which is now the most common, one of the two most commonly formed use, uh, types of rocket fuel. Still used liquid oxygen. Everything uses liquid oxygen. Uh, but it replaced ethanol alcohol with RP1, which is also known as kerosene, uh, which was much easier to acquire, much easier to burn, and uh, produced a lot more thrust. So all of these changes they did to the design not, not requiring the launch clamp, suspending it over the launch pad. This actually meant that the launch pad design itself could be very simple. So that made, it very, uh, that made it very easy for them to get the Baikonur Cosmodrome set up very quickly and get into space much more quickly. So this is part of why Amer Russia was able to beat America into orbit. They simplified. The R7 had, it, it's a beast, it has a lot, it looks like there's a lot to it, but at its core, compared to what the Americans were doing at the same time, it's actually a very simple rocket. That simplicity led to the reliability that it would eventually uh, come to have, and 
allowed them to get up and running much quick, much more quickly. Okay, fine. So let's talk about Rails a bit. So one of the other really cool things about the R7 was that they transported it by train. <laughs> Uh, the, rocket got, the rocket was assembled horizontally, and then it was transported over to the pad, and then they would r use those cables to raise it up into a vertical position suspended over the launch pad. Uh, this was much more practical than what the Americans were doing. They would uh, as assemble the rockets vertically on the pad at the time. But this meant that they could use much more specialized machinery. They could build things much quicker. They could prototype much more quickly. Uh, and this is why modern companies like SpaceX do the exact same thing. Uh, SpaceX doesn't use trains, they use a car, but the Falcon 9 gets assembled uh, in their factory in California and then put on the back of a truck and then dro uh, they drive it to the other side of the country, hoist it up and launch it. So I think this is designing for portability, which portability means something a little bit different in uh, software. But really it's about making sure that the tool that you build is flexible and can be used in as many scenarios as possible. So by contrast, right, the Americans at the time were assembling their rockets on the pad. Eventually NASA was formed. NASA wasn't actually around in the earliest days of the space race. Uh, once NASA was formed, they uh, would go on to build the VAB, that, lar that large, large building that you see in pictures of Cape Canaveral. Uh, so at that point, they would at least have a building that they could build the rocket in. And then uh, once, they built the, once they constructed the rockets, they were still constructing them standing straight up. And then they would use this beast called the crawler to roll the rocket out to the pad. And this thing is huge. And you can see, when you, if you ever go out to, to Cape Canaveral, you can see the paths that it goes down. And there's these large rocks about the size of a fist that are just completely turned to powder on the spots where, these, where the, uh, the, the tracks of the, of the crawler had gone over it because this thing is so heavy and so huge. And this thing moves incredibly slowly. Just to get to the pad, which was maybe half a mile away, would take hours or even days. It's effective, but for something small, it's hilariously inefficient. And America doesn't really have a great rail system anymore. Uh, so for rockets today, the individual components that aren't constructed at, at the VAB, they have to get sent by plane. So we also have this beast. It's a re this is a real plane. This isn't, this isn't a mock-up. This, is this is used by NASA. It's called the Super Guppy. And the front of it just sort of swings open like a door. And then they load in the cargo from the front like that. And then it flies to Florida. Uh, the, uh, like, I, I don't know, that just looks so ridiculous to me. And then um, once we went on to have the space shuttle, that got transported like this. Which, I mean, I guess this actually kind of makes sense and isn't as ridiculous, but just, that looks so funny to me. Now, there are definitely drawbacks to the approach that Russia took. The problem with shipping a rocket by train is that there's, there's an absolute maximum to the size of something that you can send by train. A train can only carry so much. So part of the reason that the Soviet N1 failed, their attempt to actually land a man on the moon, uh, was because the infrastructure for dealing with such large rockets wasn't in place. The Saturn V was able to, was able to get constructed and built and launched and tested very quickly because they did have everything set up for very, very large rockets from the get-go. So moving on to the next evolution of the R7 uh, was the launcher for the Luna probes. So the core was completely unchanged. That bottom, that bottom section below those crosses, that's the same rocket, exact same rocket that launched Sputnik. But they added a third stage. This third stage was known as the Block E, and it was powered by a single RD0105 engine. This engine was much, much smaller. It, uh, so the RD-107 and the RD-108 both produce around 1,000 kilonewtons of thrust. So combined, the first stage has 5,000 kilonewtons of thrust. The second stage has 1,000 kilonewtons of thrust. The third stage produced 50 kilonewtons of thrust. So, uh, but it did have a much higher specific impulse. When it burned all of its fuel, 
produced more thrust than would have been produced by the larger engine with the same amount. The engine was also much lighter. It weighed about one-tenth of what the RD-107 weighed. That means that overall the third stage has a lot more delta V than if it used a bigger or heavier engine. But this thing took a long time to burn. You can see, so that has, what, like 5% of the fuel of the stage below it? Less if you include the boosters. That core stage burns for a total of five minutes. This thing to burn 5% of the fuel had to burn for almost nine whole minutes. Uh, the, the, the Vostok ver variant of the R7 had one of the longest times to orbit of, of most rockets. You see an average of around 11 minutes. This thing could take up to 15. But what's amazing about this is that this was able to just work. This third stage, the Block E, they just put it on top of the existing R7 base. And suddenly, you go from a craft that can barely get that tiny little ball into orbit to something which can now go to the moon. The R7 was a very modular design. So they could iterate very rapidly. They could try out different variants of third stages and just put them on top. And then when they had a third stage that they liked, they could go back and, and change the base and improve those engines. But the third stage didn't have to care. It just sits on top. After the block E was added, so the Luna probes, uh, Luna 1 was the, first, was the first craft to fly by the moon. Luna 2 was the first craft to impact the moon, because before you can orbit it, we want to make sure that we can actually accurately hit it. So they had a little thing that just exploded and left Soviet coins all over the surface of the moon. Uh, and then Luna 3 was uh, the first craft to go around the far side of the moon and took the very first pictures of, of the side of the moon that we had never seen from Earth. So after they added the block E, they upgraded the 8K71 uh, core, which was the original R7, to, to the 8K74. And that gave us the Vostok K. And so these changes were able to be introduced and tested in complete isolation from one another. They could prove out the block E without having to build an R7 to test it. They could change the R7 without having to have a third stage to test on top of it. So this allowed for much larger teams to work on the project, and they were able to iterate much more quickly. So from there, from the Vostok K, the craft was uh, rated for human flight. The engines were not considered stable enough prior to that for a human to be on board. So once the, once the Vostok L was created, which was just rated for human flight, then, then uh, that, that gave us another very famous flight. On April 12, 1961, on board Vostok 1, Yuri Gagarin was the first person in space and the first person to orbit the Earth. Now, interestingly enough, at the time, Gagarin was not supposed to have been recognized for this record. And the reason for this is because the FAI, which was the institute responsible for keeping world records uh, related to aeronautics, their definition of crewed spaceflight had the requirement that the pilot had to land with their craft. However, the Vostok wasn't equipped to do that. The parachutes weren't large enough. So instead, the cosmonauts had an ejector seat <laughs> And seven kilometers above the Earth, they would shoot out from the, from the pod and then parachute back down to the ground. It's the most extreme form of skydiving I can imagine. So, of course, that technicality hasn't affected Gagarin's legacy. Of course he was the first person to orbit, uh, to, to orbit the Earth. I think part of why Vostok 1 is so historic is because unlike the U.S., the Russia was at a huge disadvantage when, it's, when the space race started. So much of the country had been devastated by World War II, while the US was just really angry that we had lost one harbor. The fact that Russia led the space race for so long at such a massive disadvantage is astonishing. And it makes the achievement of Gagarin and the Russian people that much more amazing. So continuing with the history of the R7, the Block E was expanded, creating the Block I, and, and an additional stage was added called the Block L, giving us the Molnya. And this brought with it one of the largest innovations of Russian spacecraft, the closed-cycle staged combustion engine. 
I won't get into the technical details of how that works, but the uh, important aspect of it is that it wastes less fuel than the gas generator cycles that had been used by all engines prior to it. Stage combustion would also eventually get adopted by the Americans, but not, not for decades later with uh, the first American engine was the space shuttle. So what's important to note is that uh, the development of staged combustion didn't replace everything underneath it. The Block I was expanded, but it was still just the same uh, breed that powered the Block E. And the core was still that same basic R7 core. Innovation's important, but you shouldn't replace everything that you're building on just because you have something new. The Molnia had a huge increase in performance, and it powered the Venera probes and the Mars probes, which were the first probes to explore Venus and Mars. The next evolution of the R7 was the Voshkod. It took the Block I third stage from the Molnia, but didn't have the fourth stage. It, got, it became human rated, and it powered crewed spaceflight from 63 until 76. Now, these crafts weren't mutually exclusive. They all coexisted. There were 300 Voshkods uh, launched. Many of them were crewed. Uh, in 1964, one year later, the Molnia got upgraded to the Molnia M, and around 300 of those were also launched, and that powered interplanetary probes or heavier payloads. And then the Vostok got upgraded that same year and was responsible for launching lighter craft for a long time. So they had different craft that filled different needs, but they all coexisted and they were all built from that same R7 design. The Molnia M remained in service until 2010. And the, the Vostok 2M, that, that upgraded version of the Vostok, was still flown until 1991. So these each saw 30 to 40 years, 50 in the case of the Molnia. So I want to focus on the R7, but it's worth just mentioning the other workhorse of, of uh, Russian spaceflight, which came around at this time, uh, the Proton. It was a super heavy launch vehicle. Uh, it was originally supposed to be a missile, but then it turned out launching really, really heavy missiles just isn't important. Uh, a nuke is a nuke. Uh, and, and this, what, unlike the R7, this was not powered by kerosene or liquid oxygen. It used unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, uh, which is a very, very toxic fuel. And Korolev was very strongly against this rocket for that reason. I don't really know how this fits into my metaphors, but it's big and overly simple, and it gets the job done, but it's completely toxic and might kill you, so I guess it kind of reminds me of Go. Anyways, now we get to the big one. In 1966, we saw the first Soyuz craft. We would see all other R7 variants start to get phased out and standardized into the Soyuz, which was essentially a beefed-up Voshkod. Uh, it, was replaced by the Soyuz L in 1975, and then uh, the Soyuz M, and those two flew less than a dozen flights. And then we got to the Soyuz U. And this is the craft that I think is the most important. It features an improved block I. It was optionally configured with two additional upper stages. And this beauty has flown 784 times since 1973, and it's still flown today. Now, crude, it's no longer used for crewed flights. That's originally what it did, but that's no longer the case. Eventually, the Soyuz U-2 came about, and crewed flights moved to that, and now crewed flights are done on the Soyuz FG. But this is a spacecraft that helped build the International Space Station. It's the craft that today is still maintaining it. America may have landed on the moon, but ultimately what we bu built were big, flashy things that didn't last. The Saturn V didn't see use outside of Apollo. The shuttle did its job and then was retired. SLS, which is the current NASA program, is over budget, years behind schedule, and still nowhere near completion. So what we have is a really bunch of really expensive projects that we had to pay for, and they did important things. But ultimately, we may have won the space race, but I don't think that's as important. Because in the long run, none of those crafts are still around today. So fuck the space race. Russia won the space marathon. So the Soyuz U uh, ended production in 2015. They're still flying the ones that had been built. Uh, the R7, it, it, the, the Soyuz U is going to have its final flight in February, and it'll be the end of the longest legacy in spaceflight. The R7 is going to live on through the Soyuz 2, uh, but the Soyuz U will end its reign. Now, what's unfortunate about this is that the Soyuz U didn't die because of technical reasons. It died because of politics. <laughs> 
Several of the components in the Soyuz U were produced in Ukraine, so the transition to the Soyuz 2 was forced. I think we can see this as a cautionary tale in open source. I think it's especially worrying in projects with a particularly opinionated BDFL model that politics can overtake the technical requirements of the project. At the end of the day, a successful project is run by a, its community, not the whims of a single person. I think this is the key to true longevity. Okay, fine. I'll stop stalling. I've been putting this off for too long. I hope you don't give this uh, talk some low marks for having so many spaceships. I'm so sorry. <laughs> So Rails is in a transitionary period. We're becoming a more mature platform. We're starting to see adoption in enterprise. And that means we have to pay a lot more attention to backwards compatibility than we have in the past. I think one of the biggest benefits that Rails has is the size and the scope of the people who work on it. You're, you'll be hard pressed to find a project which has as much activity on it as Rails. However, I think we still have a lot of work to do to make the project more welcoming to a more diverse group of people. Ultimately, the project is run by its community, so we need to ensure that ours remains vibrant. Finally, Rails has this reputation as a big, scary code base. It's not. It's just legacy code and has all of the problems associated with it. And it's getting better over time, but if we want to continue to attract new contributors, we need to do work to make the code base more approachable. We've got some big scary code monsters that are still hiding around, especially in like associations and mostly in active record. Uh, but we, we, we need, and those are always going to continue to be complex. They're doing complicated things, but we need to make sure that the code is structured such that it can be approached by new contributors. Anyway, I think we are running out of time, so I'm going to end it here. Uh, do we have time for questions? Also, I think we don't have any questions. Okay, well, so then, thank you. Easy. Thank you.